my man Robin Lee. Hey man. How, how the fuck are you, man? I'm good. I'm yeah. I'm a lot older, a lot grayer. <laughs> Couldn't have told. Couldn't have told at all. No, no, no. You, you have to look closely. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to ask you about um, how you started, right? Because you obviously don't fit the profile of a typical uh, startup entrepreneur. Mm. These guys are typically in their twenties, but you know, you started your journey late in your forties, kind of like what my what my age is. Mm. We're at that stage where typically we're kind of like you know finding some equilibrium in our lives. But you took you took it on. You took the animal on. Why? Well, it's uh, you know I think I had an itch, that was an entrepreneurial itch, with a specific idea that I wanted to pursue. I mean, originally, you know, the idea was something that I wanted to pursue in whatever guise, whether it was through a, a corporate or whether it was through uh, friends or whichever way. It just so happened that the best way of getting this idea off the ground was to go out and do a startup. And I think that's primarily the motivation for folks around my age. Um, you know, you have this idea, you're, you're desperate to, to make it real, and then you uh, take the plunge in a moment of madness. But, but the questions must have been ridiculous, right? Because you were married, you had children, You've gotten some savings. You, you know, obviously, you know, you're not the same person you are at 25. You're, you've got this, mm. you know, well, potentially you've got less years ahead of you than you have behind you, unless you live to 100, say, right? So how did you deal with all this, all these questions? Well, that's why, that's why, you know, it's the itch. I think, you know, if you need to scratch the itch, you have to scratch it. Yeah. I mean, you can't. You, you can try to ignore it, but the itch is still there. I think so that what, was. So what was, was the itch for you? The itch was to, to create something that uh, could potentially do good for society, uh, that could be beneficial to a lot of people that are disenfranchised. Uh, in the case of what we're doing in Halogov uh, in, in the financial markets, and I believe that I had the solution to fix that problem, and I wanted to see it through because I couldn't uh, see anyone taking up the the mantle of trying to fix this in a serious way uh, you know like i said at the beginning if we could have, if i could have done it with a big corporate like say blackrock you know i probably would have done that it would have been a lot uh less risky you know um but you know that wasn't uh an option open to me so i decided to do it myself ultimately it's the itch how 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 itchy are you <laughs> so i find it very hard to believe because i'm a cynical journalist yeah. right so um, altruism is, isn't typically the motivating factor for entrepreneurs. It's, it's the pot of gold, right? It is the, the cash out at the end of the journey, and that's typically what drives them. It's, it's not typically the, the mission. Mm. Is that true? Um, is, is that true? Look, does, does it matter that, you, that potentially at the end of the journey, you, you get rewarded by the insanely or in some, yeah. some size? Absolutely, it's important. But... If you set out as an entrepreneur, particularly at my age, uh, and in, even to a certain degree, you know, I'd say up to you know, 30 plus, um, on the basis that I have this idea, I think it's gonna make me incredibly wealthy, then I think you are doing it for the wrong reasons at a very rational level, because 95% of all startups fail. And you know, if you fail, you wanna fail fast, but yeah. there's a chance, there's a good chance that you'll fail uh, through a, de a death by a thousand cuts yeah, over many, yeah. many years. And, and that journey between the start and the, and the death is going to be incredibly painful. And if you're only doing it for just one reason, which is to make money, then I think you know, you're know you in for a ton of pain. Uh, you need to fundamentally believe in what you're trying to achieve, whether it's for social impact, whether it's for you know, saving the environment, whether it's to create the next Uber, the next Grab, whatever it is, you have to fundamentally believe in the idea. I mean, you know, it's like a religion. And if you can do that, then I think you are in a better place to make the right decision with your career than you would otherwise if you were just doing, oh, because I have this great idea, no one's doing it, I think I'm going to make a whole lot of money. So that would obviously guide you and Red One, your founder. But how do you translate that to your people? Because they might join you um, 
maybe because of the pot of gold, but also because they've got to buy into your vision. How do you, you know, cascade that? Because you've got, you've now got a few countries, right? You've got a few markets. You've got Indonesia, you've got Thailand. Yeah. Uh, you're starting to open up in other parts of the world. And you have to, right? Yeah. Because otherwise Malaysia is too small. Yeah, I mean, we've got about, I mean, it's insane. I think we have 70 people according to our head of HR, and we now have a head of HR. That's how big we've grown. Um, so how you sell, the, you know, Hello Gold or any startup to to potential uh, folks that that you want to work with you uh, actually depends on where they are in life, right? Um, so you know if you're talking to a fresh graduate or or, or you know early uh, so a young twenty something year old, you talk about the experiences that they're going to get in a startup environment where there's a lot of unstructured, there's less structure, and actually your ability to 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 grow is a function of your appetite to work hard because. You know, there's no such thing as, I just want you to focus on this because there's nothing else that you can do. We have so much as a startup that we need doing is that if you want to do it, by all means, because yeah. you know, there's so much that needs to be done. But when you, go to, when you talk to someone in, in their 30s, you know, late th early 30s to late 30s, where they're in a, in a place where uh, they're in a good place from a career perspective, then you need to have a slightly different conversation with them, you know, because you're bringing someone in from a, a, a job where they're hopefully in the right trajectory to one that is fraught with risks that's yeah. inherent in all startups. And yes, compensation and the pot of gold is part of the conversation, but actually more fundamentally, it's still a function of this is what we're trying to do. And, and you can be part of that story. Now, does that story excite you? If it does, then, you know, do we have the right balance between being part of history, so to speak, uh, and, and the compensation. And that's a powerful message, right? Clearly. Uh, well, it can be for some. It doesn't work for everyone because everyone wants to, uh, you know, they want the pile of, pile of cash, which is understandable. Yeah. But like I said, you know, startup risks are high and there's every chance that we can go from zero to hero and back to zero again before you cash out. So what you've done is incredibly um, expensive. I mean, obviously, you've, you've been running this for at least the last two or three years, right? You've been funding it from your own pocket. Um, you were trying to find investors, and I think you have found investors. But does that message, do, does your message to the investors um, become complicated? Because typically, the uh, startup investor or the early investor wants to, I mean, part of the proposition is to buy into youth because they've got the 20, 30 years uh, runway in front of them. But again, I mean, you and I, you know, we're, we're at a different vintage, yeah. right? Well, so I, how do you convince them about that? I, I think the, 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 the mythology of, of, of the young entrepreneur making it uh, successfully through, you know, startup through to exit is a mythology. And I think studies in the last couple of years have shown that. I mean, everyone reads about, you know, Google and Microsoft when they start up and they leave university, but they don't read about the millions of other startups where kids leave before university finishes or, you know, early in the 20s. So you, everyone hears the success stories. No one hears about the rest. I mean, studies have shown, I think, in America that there is an optimal age uh, uh, of an entrepreneur that has the right balance between experience, energy, um, connections, a business idea, business acumen, etc. And that's around the 40s. So yes, I'm still on the wrong side of that. <laughs> I mean, you know, but um, the, the issue is, I think, um, for a lot of people, it isn't just about the idea, because ideas are relatively simple. You start to execute. So execution and experience actually come to the fore once you have the idea. As an as a investor, and look, I, you know, in my previous life, I've invested as an LP alongside uh, VCs. The issue is this. You know, there are three fundamental questions people need to ask. Do I like the idea? Do I believe that this is going to be massive? Okay. If so, that you go to the next question. The next question is, is the guy sitting opposite me someone that I can, be, I believe, will be able to execute successfully an idea with him and his team? You know. Then the last question is, okay, if those two things are yes, then let me do the math to see how big this can possibly be on a risk-adjusted basis, and then I make a decision as to how much to invest. I mean, rationally, that's what investors should be doing. Um, there's no point having a great idea if, you know, you look across the table and regardless of age, you see the guy say, mm, I'm not sure he knows the right people or has enough experience in this space to execute because it'll just be a great idea that fails. So it's, it's also conversely, right? When you talk to investors as well, you want to get the right guys on board because the, 
the wrong investors on your board of directors can be a huge, and in fact, it, it is a huge challenge, right? They'll run over you sometimes. So when you when you talk to investors as well, how, how do you um, assess that you've got the right guys potentially on board? What kind of what kind of things do you look out for? Okay, the, there is the theory and then there's the reality. What, which one do you want, the theory or the reality? <laughs> <laughs> well, the theory, you're absolutely right, right? You want, uh, uh, you want folks that not just give you the money, but also can add value to whatever it is you're doing, either in terms of their network or in terms of the experience, so they can mentor you, uh, so that you, know, you, you make fewer mistakes um, and they help you go to market for the next round. So that's the theory. The reality, particularly in Malaysia, is fundamentally different. Um, most of last year, I did a series of talks at conferences about the challenges of doing a startup in Malaysia, yeah. a tech startup, within the context of just the ASEAN region. And this is the tragedy of it all right now. You know, uh, if you look, a survey was done last year uh, by one of the publications asking entrepreneurs, you know, where's your, where's your preferred choice of location if you to do a startup? 50% of the market said Singapore out of the whole Predictably. ASEAN. Pr predictably. Um, which is a challenge for, for a country like us because yeah. it means you have a, a, a brain drain. Yeah. Then they were asked why, and, and they said, well, it's a function of talent and funding. Okay? And when you break down the fund, then you look at the funding levels uh, between just Malaysia and Singapore. The average startup in Malaysia got, I think, like 60% less funding than the comparable startup in Singapore, which means that you are disadvantage from the get-go yeah all right and that then spills over to hiring because in the tech space if you're hiring uh, and you're hiring at a regional level for talent so you find someone I don't know in Laos or Myanmar a tech guy that you want to hire and he has a choice to leave his family to work in Singapore or Malaysia and in Malaysia you're paying him a third of what that he earns in Singapore there's only one winner in this he will go to Singapore yeah so the question then is, how do you fix that, right? And you fix that by raising more money. So the challenge for a lot of startups... So, so you're willing to pay th over the odds to get the guy to come and sit with you in Malaysia rather than Singapore? Well, he doesn't have to sit with me in Malaysia, but he just has to work for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality, right. because uh, there's a, tech, a dev tech shortage in the region, just generally around the world, yeah. but more so in the region. So then how do you address that? You address that by raising more money, but you know, people don't raise that much money in Malaysia. And, and, you know, coming back to your original question, you know, the reality is this, you know, if people are going to give you checks, um, you know, there, there's a huge temptation to, to just take the check, regardless, because... because yeah, you need the cash. Because you need the cash, need cash to, run, to yeah. fund, you know, your business. <coughs> um, and so, uh, theoretically, I, I get it, but actually the reality is it's a hugely difficult balance to maintain. Uh, I think for any any startup entrepreneur within the context of yeah. ASEAN X Singapore and Indonesia because you might end up uh, managing your investors and managing their expectations much more than you would otherwise have liked to do in running the business and starting the business right I mean mm. I've been in that situation before yeah. and I've had um, investors bang their hands on the table asking whether revenue is they don't understand the business mm. they take up all your time they drain you emotionally it's, it's terrible it's, it's a huge hey. Penalty, but the flip side to that is at least you have a business to run right. <laughs> <laughs> with, their, with their cash, with right? their cash, right? Yeah. So that that's that's constant. I mean, having said that, you know, we've been very fortunate with our investor base. Um, you know, we have uh, incredibly uh, uh, helpful investors in in terms of giving us the space to grow and to recover from the mistakes that we make. And so, yeah, long may that continue. So you, you came from the World Gold Council. I think you were the CFO there. Yes. Biggest um, gold-backed uh, fund in the world. Mm. And then before that, the Securities Commission. I kind well, of Well, there was a few things in yeah, between. Yeah, right? in between. <laughs> <laughs> but typically financial industry, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Those institutions don't lend themselves to entrepreneurs, generally speaking. Yeah. Uh, so do you think you came from that ilk generally? Or did you, did you just... Did you just really want to make it happen and, and test yourself in the world of business? Because I think... This is, this is your first one, right? The second ish, one ish, is, but first yeah. one that got off the ground. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, so I, I think the, you know, if, if you are ambitious in whatever it is that you choose to do, whether it's a mainstream career in a corporate or to do a startup, I, I think it's not so much whether you are entrepreneurial or not. I mean, you are ambitious to yeah. 
achieve certain things and you'll you know think about what it will take to achieve those goals uh, and i think in that sense uh, i guess i have a slightly different view from a lot of other people in terms of there are some certain folks that are more uh predispos predisposed to become an entrepreneur than others yeah i think if you're sufficiently ambitious um and you understand risk reward and you're pretty rational you can flip between the two so when you when you run the business now right and and uh, obviously you you're you're, you're caning it right mm. I, i've never seen you know you told me that you you've never worked as hard as this in your life yes um, right yeah. how, how, how how bad how, how hard is it how it's, hard are you i mean literally explain your day to me well it's okay my day okay I, i'm not sure i'm the best example best practice as to how to do this thing because there's no balance um let me let me start by this you know the, the you know if again i come back to ambition if you're incredibly ambitious uh, uh in in a, in a corporate job uh, and uh, uh, uh you will work very hard you can take your holidays but you can choose to work through your holidays just to achieve your ambition and you will not stop right but you can also choose to take a break and take the, those four weeks off and just decompress yeah um that choice is yours uh, and you won't lose your job because of it your 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 superiors are unlikely to think any less of you um i think in, in an entrepreneurial startup in an entrepreneurial setup the, it's slightly different i can take my time off but actually the business needs me so you know uh that choice is uh, kind of like a false choice i kind of have it but i don't um you know i have you know investors to look after mouths to feed literally and we need to get to a level where we are sustainable so you know it's always on uh and and that's a huge it has been on for the last three years and it's been on for the last three <laughs> years yeah so so you, you never really have a break you're always thinking about it and whatever you're doing you know whoever you know whether you're on holiday whether you wake up in the middle of the night and you think, oh shit <laughs> you know and you start doing some work and then you go back to sleep or try to get to sleep um so you're always on um i'm not saying that's the right thing but that's the pressure that you're under i think the other big difference between um you know startup life and, and the corporate life and i tell this to my team is that and i tell this to to people that work with us contractors that work with us you know we can't afford to get it wrong we have to hit the we have to hit the mark every time because if we don't achieve what we set out to achieve this year there's no next year but that's impossible right who can get it right 10 out of 10 well you can't but you got to basically fix it as you go along i mean i've heard various people describe what startup life is like i mean the way i used to describe it is like this imagine you're in a car i don't know there's a volkswagen thing beetle right yeah. um 2cv or whatever that is you're you're on a volkswagen beetle uh, on the north south highway and your challenge is to convert that volkswagen beetle to a maserati um uh, whilst you're still driving and there's traffic <laughs> on the wrong side of the road that's what a startup life is like i mean you are making decisions based on the best information based on the environment that you know and yes you're bound to screw up the, so the challenge is to minimize the amount of systemically bad decisions and maximize the ones that are good and sometimes yeah. you get it wrong and but hopefully the ones that you get wrong are are things that you know you can afford to screw up like oh i got the radio connected the wrong way yeah as opposed to the radio is not connected to the brakes yeah yeah so there's all kind of things that can go wrong but there's two sides of it right because there's the stuff that you can control which is within your organization and within your sphere and then there's the stuff which is out of your control right mm -hmm. so the stuff within your control um it, it, intuitively kind of, it seems kind of easy e easier if you're in an established business like you know maybe you're developing properties mm. or you run a, a hospital or something which are, you know you can kind of like the people have been there before there's there's a roadmap which you can follow there's a there's a blueprint but you are in something which is completely different right you're doing you're, you're building a global gold transaction platform you're doing it on blockchain technology you're trying to do it in ASEAN where there's 650 million people um, and mm. you've got a, a, a large enough market right mm. all three of which have largely been <laughs> there, there is no blueprint mm. you're, you're forging the blueprint yes so how, how fucking hard is it uh, well uh, th again theoretically it isn't that hard because you know theoretically we had a business plan we had a roadmap we kind of knew exactly what we wanted to do but you know things happen along the way and also 
our hypothesis, our, so our assumptions sometimes um, don't pan out the way they pan out and then you have to adjust. Uh, yeah. So it's a combination of things. Externalities uh, affect your life. Um, in, internal stuff happens because you know you hire people and, and, and hiring is a very important piece because the people are the ones that are going to build this business. And sometimes you get it wrong, you know, and then you have to fix it. You, are, you know, uh, and we have gotten it wrong. Uh, and, you know, we've made uh, tough decisions to fix those things. Other times you, you have a strategy that you think will work. And then in hindsight, you say, oh, okay, that was never going to work. And yeah. so, uh, what was I smoking when I, <laughs> when I came up with that idea? But hopefully you, you, um, you learn from it. I don't think it's, like you said, it's realistic to... to to hit the ground, hit the mark every time. But I think what is realistic is to have a clear game plan and, and clear um, a clear sense as to what you do if it doesn't work. Yeah. So for the typical entrepreneur, right, who is about to start his own business or he's maybe in the early throes of the romance, what are the kind of like um, the, mo- the most pressing issues that, that, that plague, if you like, for want of a better word, the entrepreneur? Is it hiring right? Is it paying the right salaries? Is it you know building new market, making the best use of technology? There's so many things, yeah. right? In your opinion, what is it? Um, okay, assuming that the idea is a great idea. Okay. Okay, so that's the base assumption. Okay, you're, yeah, you're not, you have, you're not, okay. You're not, you're not starting another burger stall, right? For yeah. example. Because having said that, you know, um, ever since I came back to Malaysia and ever since we started creating uh, a presence in the marketplace, you know, uh, from time to time people come and chat with me because they have an idea and they want to bounce it off me. Uh, and you know, I'd say uh, a large chunk of them are, are. I mean, I just don't see the value proposition. Uh, and I mean, that's if you want to go back to the basic, you got to have something that you know yeah. has legs. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and there's a fine line between uh, believing in what you do so much that you ignore everyone that says no because they'll just drag you down. Yeah. And also believing it because it's but there's nothing in it. And I don't know what the answer to that, but let's assume. The you know the idea is great. That I think within the Malaysian context, the most important thing is funding. Uh, the big challenge in Malaysia is that your access to funding, uh, either through the VC space, angel space, you know, government grants, is actually very very limited. So still, you, yeah, even still, absolutely. Uh, you know, um, like I said, you know, that's why last year I spent most of last year talking about, you know, how to fix this problem because you know how the gold was fortunate uh, we raised a, a quite a substantial amount of money but i think we were one of the exceptions and i want yeah. to try and fix the problem for the folks coming after us yeah at least try and you know have that conversation um so i think the most important thing is funding if you can't get enough funding uh, you're kind of stuck right um you, 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 is, is, is there any way you can run a business and, and and build the business through um organic means organically means you build it, you get enough revenue. That revenue helps pay for the the, the, the the expenses, and then you do it via not set, you know not setting your share or you and Red One share yeah. because clearly, yeah. uh, when you relinquish equity or you relinquish ownership in the company, at mm. some point in time, if you're not careful, you're yeah. gonna lose control of a business and then you get pushed yeah. out like like well, Steve Jobs did, right? Yeah. Well, so so yeah, absolutely. Theoret- again, theoretically, it is entirely possible to do that, uh, and you know people have done that. You know. Uh, there are startups that were that were instant successes, right? They they they, they became cash flow positive within the first six months. That's right. Uh, but that's the exception, not the norm, right? I mean, if you're lucky t- enough to have that idea and you're you know, awesome enough to execute on well, it, well, you so, just don't grow fast enough at the speed that you want to. Um, but right. then 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 the issue is this, right? If you this is the the problem. If your idea is good, and you obviously you're only doing it because you think your idea is good. Yeah. You, once you go to market, um, you can't legislate against other people coming in. Yeah. So imagine the scenario, you know, I'm a Malaysian startup, you know, I have this idea, I have limited funds, so I'm just gonna grow it on a sustainable way. That's gonna get me 10 years to get to cash flow break even, and then before I can uh, move to an- another market. I have an Indonesian startup with the same idea, the same capabilities, execute at the same time, and then at some point they decide they're going to expand. Even if they expand at the same time into a new market, so you go, your Malaysian one goes to Indonesia, Indonesian one goes to Malaysia, the Indonesian one is in all likelihood going to eat you up because they have greater firepower, because they have more customers, because it's a bigger market, they yeah. have a bigger uh, funding capacity. 
and in a, in a war attrition, you will run out of cash. So, you know, like I said, notwithstanding so the need, lucky ones you, you that you need have, to raise that money, you need yeah. to sell that, that equity. But then, then, then there's the perennial conundrum, right? Because if you sell shares too early in the business, you sell it at a cheaper price because yeah. your valuation is lower. And then you hopefully want to get to a certain size where you sell at a higher price and then you, you get rid, where you lose less shares than business. No, absolutely. So, so how, how do you navigate that? People talk about it and I, you know, it's slightly like different for me. I think if I was talking to a kind of younger guy, so late 20s, early 30s, and it's their first startup, then you, you have life for a couple more, right? Um, you know, get the first one under your belt. Yeah. 100% of nothing is still nothing the last yeah. time I checked. Yeah. When you have 10% of something, it's still more than 100% of nothing. Yeah. Um, look, if you're lucky enough to be able to sustain this business and grow at a fair pace uh, without dilution, of course you do that, right? Um, because why not? Uh, but if you are able to manage the, the balance between retaining control and ownership and, and getting funding, then, uh, then you know, try and figure out what that is. And yeah. actually what's more important from a, from a startup standpoint is not how much you own, but how much you can control. Because what you need to do is make sure that even if you dilute away your ownership of the business to get the funding, you still have retain sufficient equity to manage the business because ultimately it's your idea and ultimately the investors bought into you executing it not them executing it yeah uh, until such time as if if you screw it up and you make the wrong decisions then you don't have enough shares of the business then they might vote you out like what happened with steve jobs yeah or or you 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 sell too much equity in the business and then when it's time to cash out you know, rather than having 51% of the business, which is worth, I don't know, say 10 million bucks, you only have 3% of the business, which is only worth 10, do you know what I mean? So, yeah. so then the, the proposition, so again, I mean, does, does that all yes. play into your mind when you-, when you um, Actually for me, no, uh, to, to your first point, right? If, if you screw up a business so badly that the shareholders want to kick you out, yeah, then you probably deserve to be kicked out. <laughs> um, Did Steve Jobs, you know, did, what, did Steve Jobs deserve to be kicked out? In well, they brought him, they brought him back in. They did, but yes. after three or four years, after he built Pixar, right? Yeah, so, so, you know, uh, um, that, that's that's the contract that you make when you yeah. do these transactions, yeah. right, when, when you sell shares. So it's, it's something, it's no different from when you're uh, working in a corporate. You do well, you get the job. You don't do well, you get you, sacked. You get sacked. Yeah. Uh, so in my mind, that's, that's, that's fair game. Um, of course, you want to, not get sacked, but if you're doing such a crappy job, then you deserve it. Now, in terms of compensation, at the end of the day, you, you know, like I said, um, I think there's a f big difference between what you want and what you need. Yeah. yeah and come back to the 20 something year old, 30 year old person, right? You have, you know, a 20 year old, 20 year long career path ahead of you to do whatever it is you want. If you, so long as you get your first one off the ground, your second one's going to be much easier to get off the ground in terms of getting funding, getting the right kind of talent uh, into into the business. So, getting something out of it, I think, is a huge, huge benefit rather than you know being too dogmatic about how much you own. Notwithstanding the fact that you want to retain management control, and of course, you want to maximize the value for all the hard work that you put in. Yeah, yeah. So the whole idea behind Hello Gold um, and, and the valuation that you are getting yeah. is because not just about Malaysia, right? It's, it's, a, it's the global market. And North America, by and large, has got some players, right? Mm. The Canadian guys and so on yeah. and so forth. And the UK is same as well. Yeah. But the, the pot of gold mm. is in ASEAN, is in Asia, is in China, is in Indonesia, is yeah. in Thailand. Um, Malaysia is too small, 31 million people, mm. right? Yeah. How do you crack this code? Because every, every other guy wants it. Every other guy wants to have a good sizable market share yeah. in the 650 million people in ASEAN. Yeah. And the big guys are the Indonesians, the Thais, the, yeah. the, the Burmese, right? How are you doing it? Well, well first off, you know, um, what we're trying to do with Gold, it, it, we want to be an emerging market play. We want to be kind of like the black rock for, for the mass market and that, emerging markets. Yeah, that's so where the growth is. Yeah, that's where the growth is. And also that's where we think uh, the people, the, we have the most number of people with the, with the pain points that we're trying to solve. Coming back specifically to ASEAN, um, well, it remains to be seen whether we can crack it. We think yeah. we have the we think we figured out the code to crack it, but we're now try, we're we are just we have just recently launched in Thailand, so we'll know in the next twelve months whether we've cracked it or not. 
uh, and, and you know we're going to head into Indonesia. We've set up shop in Indonesia. We hope to launch in the second half of the year. I think cracking the, one, one of the benefits of ASEAN is that. Um, it's a huge market, but it's not a homogenous market. It's not. That's, it's right. like a, That's the biggest challenge. You can see it's the biggest challenge, but also what it means is that it is uh, advantage. You can turn it to your advantage. What I mean by that is that it means that anyone that comes in, uh, whether you know if it's a Tencent or Ant Financial, they have to go to market. They can't just launch in one platform and 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 and, and hit the ground running across the whole of ASEAN. They have to go country by country too. Um, so, so it slows down the ability to 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 be all pervasive, and uh, you know, not that you know we look at Ant Financial as Tencent as our competitors, <laughs> not yet. Potential buyers, <laughs> maybe. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so, so a lot of our competitors, you know, a lot of the homegrown startups in Thailand and Indonesia, they they have the same issues as us. So, so we can equalize, uh, and what we believe, and this is where the investors come in, and you know, the age and experience comes in. You know, do you have the network, the experience, the contacts to navigate the regulators, the policymakers, the potential partners, so that you can hit the ground running with the right kind of ecosystem in new markets? So, you know, if you're an Indonesian or a Filipino company trying to go to Thailand, I mean, do you have that available to you and that you can uh, bring that up as fast as you can? Uh, we believe, and like I said, uh, it remains to be tested, that uh, we have. The, the guts of those in, in, those ingredients to make a successful attempt at being uh, uh, pervasive in, in the key ASEAN countries over the next couple of years. Those ingredients, do they come from your investors or do they come within your personal uh, networks? Because, because, I mean, s some of the precedents that have come and gone in the past, um, I, you know, cite, cite things like maybe the e-commerce retailers, the Lazadas, the Shopees of this world, they're in seven countries, right? Mm. Uh, maybe the Air Asians of this world who have come and gone with regu same, same kind mm, of yeah, things, right? Yeah. Regulators, yes. banks and what have you. Um, do they come via your investors or you buy via e ecosystems? Uh, I think it's a combination of the two. Um, I think, you know, like Lazada on the e-commerce side is unregulated market. So it's just it's like Amazon, right? You don't need... C kind of same as you guys, yeah. right? Well, the Zada Pay, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, I think the regulated pro regulated businesses are a lot more challenging, and that's where I think you know you can try to take advantage of the inherent challenges of going to each country. There's no passporting, um, and I think you know this is where uh, you know whether it's our investors or our own network, you know the contacts that we have and the contacts that we can build through those respective uh, parts of our kind of mentors, advisors, etc., become incredibly important so that, you know, they can pick up the phone and, and, and connect us with the right folks. Yeah. And we build out, build out our own network and then we can then, like I said, build up for our business model the partnerships that we need to, to, yeah. to make us successful. So then again, it goes back to the whole notion of um, raising the right capital from the right, from the right people because if you get the wrong guys on board, you're sunk. Comes to regionalization, because I, I guess every entrepreneur worth their salt in this part of the world wants to attack and, and beat and, and conquer the ASEAN market. I mean that that is the real market to be in. Um, well, no, look, I mean, uh, I, I think you know entrepreneurs come in all shapes and sizes, and and you know some folks just want to do Malaysia, some folks just want to do Singapore, and that's fine. You know, I think if you can get your business up and running and be successful in whatever. Your op your ambition uh, may be. I think that's that's incredible yeah. achievement. So I don't think, you know, the scale of what it is that you're trying to do dictates, you know, how wonderful it is. Um, so again, depending on on the context of what you're trying to build, that can drive, you know, how important, you know, the type of investor you need uh, can look like. Yeah. But I still come back to my point. I still fundamentally believe this because, you know, you know, hollow gold aside. You know, I've met, I'm going to say about 10 different people that had 10 different ideas that came to me for advice as to how to get their businesses off the ground. And it's incredibly challenging. Um, money is still important, right? Um, if you have investors that are going to give you money, um, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a price that you need to consider paying. So even if you think you've got a fantastic idea, base assumption, good plan, right? Good, mm. good business. Good, good growth potential. Mm. 
What what kind of hit rate can people expect? Is it ten percent, five percent? Ten percent of what? Um, so if you meet ten investors, uh. h- half of them might bite. Might bite. Was well, so one of them might bite? Let's let's find the ten percent, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think I think it gets harder. Uh, the more money you want, <laughs> the more money you want to raise. Because I thought the more money you want, then kind of makes it easier. Because nobody likes small ticket sizes, right? When you're a startup, like a seed round, uh, that or Series A, yeah. uh, you know, it's actually quite hard to raise a size amount of cash. It just yeah. really does depend. Yeah. I think if you're trying to raise like I don't know, five hundred thousand ringgit, I don't think it's that. I think it's relatively straightforward. Yeah. If you want to raise five hundred thousand US, I think that's a bit more challenging. It's if you want two million ringgit, yeah. If you want to raise five million US, I think that's incredibly challenging. And look, that's that was you know we raised north of five million US. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, um, it, it, it is incredibly challenging at, at that kind of end of the spectrum. I mean, what we raised was comparable to what startups r- raised in in. Uh, a mature developed market like North America uh, and Western Europe. Uh, it's practically unheard of within the uh, Malaysian context. Yeah, yeah. Given that's that that stage of the life cycle that we're in. Yeah, because because I want to go back to the point where you said that um, a, a successful regionalization plan comes with your knowledge and your expert uh, and your contacts with regulators and and, and banks mm. potentially. Um, at consumer level, right? Mm. F- for you to expand to a Burma or Thailand or mm. Indonesia or Singapore, even, um, I thought intuitively it's it's really the uh, the pr- propensity of the relatively young Asian population to use smartphones and to do transactions on smartphones rather than at a teller's traditionally, mm. right? Mm. So that's one entry point. Then, then and then there's gold. Gold is something that everybody understands, yeah. but not the young person. But young, the young person wants to buy bitcoins. He doesn't want to buy gold. I mean, that's an assumption. Mm. Uh, what is your experience with? Um, well, our, our, our hypothesis when we built Hello Gold was that um, our typical uh, customer would be in their late 20s, late 30s, probably urban, probably married, probably uh, just one kid or about to have a kid. They have a place of their own. Uh, they have both, both, both husband and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend work. Did you did you conduct a study for that, or did you just you know uh, straw survey? plucked it out? <laughs> plucked it out of your <laughs> uh, well, uh, yes and no. So uh, because of you know I, I was fortunate enough to spend a, a long time with the Wargo Council, we had done a lot of surveys in a lot in a lot of markets, not in Malaysia specifically, but a lot of markets from China and India to to uh, Western Europe and North America. Uh, and the hypothesis that I made was that, look, unless Malaysians were fundamentally different from Chinese and Indians and Europeans, they would all have the same kind of propensity to buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, and, we, and I, I can tell you now, right, after a year and a half in Malaysia, that uh, the, hypo- the hypothetical customer is exactly what we have, except for one difference. Uh, I expected a, a, a more balanced gender split. Actually, the, the bulk of our customers are males. That was the only surprising thing. But everything else is exactly what we thought it was going to be. Why do you think that is? Because typically, again, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know. We're still trying to figure that out. Because and then we developed an app that we thought was uh, gender neutral and not terribly aggressive. If there's anything, the Hello Gold app is it's, it's quite friendly to the, to the fairer sex. Yes. In, in terms of the way it's designed. In fact, our first uh, so icon was a, a, a lady. Right. <laughs> but no, uh, it's just it's just happened that way. Um, and frankly, I, you know, I don't know why. Yeah. Um, but that aside, that one specific attribute aside, everything else is absolutely spot on. So coming back to, you know, your question, you know, the for our target market, you know, they 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 need a way to enable them to get ahead in life. Too many people don't have the ability to save well I mean, in Malaysia. You have this problem. Banigara has said that seven out of ten Malaysians don't have the ability or, or the confidence that they can afford a, a thousand ringgit emergency. Uh, and when you set that in contrast to the fact that the minimum deposit that you can put into a fixed deposit in a bank in Malaysia is a thousand ringgit, and you have to hold it there for six months, uh, there's a fun, there's a mismatch between what the market offers and what the people need. So there is a gap there. Um, and we think that gold fits that space uh, for uh, against uh, 
non-interest bearing cash accounts, yeah. which is basically what you default into if you don't have enough money to put into fixed deposit. And our average transaction size is about 80 to 100 ringgit, you know, um, which again, you know, falls into that bracket of the income level that we thought our, our customers would be earning. And so, uh, you know, for them, they want something they can understand. Um, and Bitcoin, as attractive as it may be to a, the, the, the informed market, is not something they naturally understand from a savings perspective. And so, yeah. you know, I, I don't think at this point in time, uh, there is a, 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 a goal and Bitcoin can be compared for the markets that we're trying to serve. You know, yeah. for, for other segments, absolutely, potentially. But, you know, for the people that we're trying to serve, I think um, gold is a far more attractive and compelling proposition for them. Yeah, so your um, typical client would be, as you said, right, late 20s, urban, you yeah. know, two incomes, one child, what have you. Yeah. They would probably be more willing to uh, not have their gold with them physically, right? Typically, right? Because the older fogies would mm. want to have their gold in their pockets or under their beds, mm. and then they can take them out every night and have a look at them and, and whatever, mm. right? Yeah. That's okay. Uh, that's We're, okay. Uh, we, uh, so... You know, when we first started Howard Gold, we didn't do the survey. Yeah. But when we went to Thailand, we did the survey because yeah. now, you know, we were funded. We had, yeah. you know, we want to test the hypothesis. Yeah. And, and what we found was that, um, yes, there are there is a huge segment of society that will always want the physical, uh, that are traditional buyers of gold. And, yeah. and that's absolutely true, not just in Thailand, but across the world. Um, and age may come into it, but I don't think age does. It's just your... Yeah. So that's another assumption, yeah. which is kind of off kilter. Uh, no, no, it's actually what we we. Yeah. W I always knew that there'll be a huge chunk of the market that will always want physical yeah. gold bars and coins because globally that's the largest. You want to market. take it on and have a look and, exactly. and have a peace of mind, right? Yes, exactly. But one of the big challenges is that uh, doing that is uh, it's um, emotionally it's an understandable thing to do, but rationally it's the worst kind of investment you can make. Why? For our target market, if you want to buy a one gram coin, uh, one gram coin is about 170 ringgit, right? So the value of the coin is 170 ringgit. But when you go to a shop to buy that coin, it'll cost you anything up to 220, 230 ringgit. If you go to Google any of the banks today and ask them, you know, just check how much a one gram coin is worth. I mean, how much it will cost to buy the one gram coin, it'll be 220, 230 ringgit. So that's 20, 20 or 30% markup yes. on, spot, on, yes, on the spot. Yes, exactly. Rate. So you, imagine this, right? You're buying something, if you say you're buying Sing Dollar, right? Uh, and the Sing Dollar ringgit conversion is three ringgit, but you have to go to, you say, it's okay, I'm going to buy it at 380 because, <laughs> you know, that's what you're going to, it's a bad investment. That's crazy. That's 25% above what it should be. It is because if you think about what it costs to make that piece of gold, right? You, someone has to buy the gold that's worth 170 ringgit for 170 ringgit because you won't buy that because that's, that's right. the prevailing price. So yeah. already you cannot uh, buy the one gram at 170 ringgit. Then you've got to make it, convert that big bar of gold into the small one gram. Yeah. There's costs involved in that. Yeah. Then you've got to deliver it to the wholesaler. Yeah. Then the wholesaler's got to deliver it to the retailer. So there's a lot of uh, steps in the process and therefore costs in the process before it comes to you. So it's not that, you know, when you go to a, a jewelry shop or goldsmiths, you know, when they sell it for 220, 230 ringgit, they're making it 20, 30%. They're actually making, you know, that five, 10%, whatever. There's like tons of layers in between. But there's a lot of intermediation in between, which is why, and then when you want to sell it, it's also a big you problem. You get whacked as well. <laughs> you get whacked as well, because the one of the big challenges with gold, particularly uh, in, in, in the retail space, is you can do a lot of stuff to gold. You can take out the gold and put like non-gold yeah, yeah. elements in there. So they'll always sell it, buy it back from you at a, at a, a, lower, five, price. At a lower price, yeah. like a 5 6 7% discount. But more importantly than that, that... That sounds generous. I mean, uh, I've, I've been told you, you don't get 80 cents on the dollar. Okay. Oh, that's, right. that's, that's even worse. Right. But even worse than that, you actually have to go back to the shop that you bought it from. Because if you buy from Habib, you can't sell it in the Pokong. No. Well, right. you're, you, if they do, it'll be an even steeper discount. Yeah. So when you come to what we're trying to do, you know, we sell that one gram to you at 170 ringgit plus our kind of fee right now. It's tiny. Like this yeah. tiny fee. And, want, and you can sell it back to us at any point in time for this, whatever the prevailing price is. 
But can they sell it out of your ecosystem? They, they can't, right? They still got to be, be within your network. Yes, but the poor point is this, right? It's a financial product. I mean, people are buying gold to your initial point because they want to look at it, but ultimately it's a financial investment. It's a safe haven thing. So at some point in time, if you ever need to use it, you're going to sell it for cash, right? So all we're doing, we're, we're no different. If you think about the example where you go to the jewelry shop, you buy the gold, at some point in money, you have to go back to the jewelry shop and sell it. That's all we're doing. We're just a much more efficient way of doing it. And you so can do it from the, from, the, from the convenience of your own home on your mobile phone 24-7. That is insane because a lot of people think they buy gold. It's, it's a safe. Well, it is a store. Of, it's, a, it's a good store of, of, of your value, yes. right? But they don't understand that they're buying it at a huge markup to market prices. Yeah. They don't even realize that when they sell it back to the market, yeah. they're yeah. getting whacked again. So they're in the hole by 50, 60%. Well, yes, on, the, on the bid ask, Particularly, I mean, this is not true if you're buying a million dollars worth of gold, all right? But it's still, it, the, the percentages still come into play. No, well, once you get to a certain level, um, so, because it all comes to the making cost, right? So, so say the making cost is 10 ringgit, okay? So 10 ringgit as a percentage of 170 ringgit is huge, but 10 ringgit as a percentage of a million ringgit worth of gold is small. And the delivery cost, you know, so uh, that's why, you know, when people buy a lot of gold, you can buy the physical. I mean, you have different issues about selling it and liquidating it. But that aside, uh, that your your bid ask spread, your round trip is relatively cheap. Yeah. But you have the inconvenience of of getting of liquidating it. So, for example, when you buy a kilo bar, which is about the size of 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 the phone, it, it, and that's like one hundred seventy thousand ringgit. You know, you still have you can still sell it back, but they will typically you know check it. Potentially, right? Because yeah. you can do stuff. Yeah. And you buy the gold finger bar, the 400 ounce bar, which is, you know, about uh, 400, so it's about 1.4 million ringgit. You can never even sell that back. You have to take the refiner and they'll melt it down for you because they will. That's too yeah, big. Yeah, that's too big. <laughs> they, 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 they're not sure that what you're selling them is actually full gold. Yeah, yeah you exactly. Got, you, got like, yeah, you can do yeah, stuff. So if you yeah, Google yeah. Type dodgy gold bars <laughs> and look at the images, you can see. So that is crazy. So it, it sounds like you're building this platform, which makes a lot of sense for people to transact in gold. But then a lot of people, they don't realize. They don't realize the truth behind yeah. what they're paying and what they're getting for yes. a, a real estate. So, you're going to be spending a lot of money educating people on awareness. Well, and th that's why, you know, it's, it's a long answer to the original question, yeah. you know. Um, so for folks that buy gold in a traditional yeah. way, you know, their propensity to continue to do that is actually very, very high because they're used to that. They're comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, our, our market in Malaysia currently uh, is made up of for seven out of ten of our customers have never bought gold before. So for them, there's no education. No involved. issue. There's yeah. no issue, right? They're comfortable with it and they do it. And when we did our survey in Thailand, it was exactly the same thing, right? The people that bought gold that buy physical gold are, are, are more reluctant to change their ways of doing it. But the folks that have never bought gold before but want to buy gold are more, have a greater propensity to buy through a platform like ours. Fantastic. And in, in, in the context of Thailand, I think, and I can't remember the exact uh, numbers, 20, only, and Thailand is a massive gold market. Only, as massive as it is, only about 20% of the population buy gold, buys gold. I mean, 80% doesn't. That's crazy. So, you know, we're targeting the 80%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So there's this idea that because the markets are, what, 10 years into the cycle, it's like the tail end of the whole rally, right? Mm. Um, and gold is going to explode this year. I mean, that's that's the thinking, generally speaking. Mm. Do you get the same sense? Well, that's what people said last year. <laughs> uh, this time last year, most people were expecting gold to break out um, and, and go into another cycle. Um, let me answer in two ways. I, I, the First of all, I think... Um, there's always, it's always a good time to buy gold. Uh, the way I describe gold for our target market and actually for most people is, is like house insurance uh, from, for your investment portfolio. If you think about house insurance, you know, or, uh, you know, everyone buys house insurance every, every year. And actually what they hope is that it's a waste of money, right? Yeah, they hope that yeah. I'm throwing money down the drain of house insurance because if I have to use my house insurance, it means something bad has happened and I don't want anything bad to happen. So I like to waste money buying house insurance. <laughs> But I, would need, I need to know that I have the security of house insurance. Gold is kind of like that. 
under normal market conditions, you know, when markets are well, doing well, and you have investment advisors, you read the financial press, you make decisions, and, mark, and you can do well with your investment portfolio. Gold does nothing. It's kind of asymmetric uh, against uh, most uh, assets. But when markets are very stressed, gold becomes negatively correlated. And you've seen it in, in crises after crises, when anything's going south, and you have to sell something to pay for uh, your children's education, your, your, your mortgage, you, you don't want to sell a losing position. You want to sell something that you can liquidate. Yeah. And that's where gold comes in. Gold is like your proxy for insurance against your investment portfolio just blowing up. Yeah. So you always want a little bit of it, uh, I think, at all times. Is that like an ideal proportion, 3%, 3% um, 5% or whatever? Well, uh, if you look at the World Gold Council, I think they talk about you know, anything between 3 to 10%, depending on, on where you are in yeah. life. Um, so so you know, it, it really depends on your risk appetite, yeah. right? It, the lower your risk appetite, the more kind of gold you want, uh, then the higher the risk appetite, the less gold you want. So that's one aspect. The second, then I get more immediately, you know, I think there is the upside potential of gold is far higher than, than the downside potential because there's so many things at play right now uh, around the world that, that talks to a, 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 a push in the price upwards, you know. You have North uh, American politics um, and its impact on, on, on globalization, trade, North Korea, Middle East, Turkey. I mean, you, know, you have Brexit, um, you have the China slowdown. I mean, there are all these things happening that, that uh, would suggest that, you know, there's a greater chance that gold will break out rather than a, a lower chance of it breaking out. So I think, you know, the time is right. And then lastly is that financial crises tend to happen in, in uh, every seven to eight years. Uh, and we are beyond seven to eight years uh, in, in the, since the last one. And I just want to end on, on this other note. I mean, usually I, I, I answer the question with another question <laughs> when it comes to gold, because I don't want to be the one selling gold, yeah. right? Because obviously I'm the gold guy. Um, so I usually ask, you know, whoever's asking me the, to answer these questions. Do you think China and India are going to continue to prosper economically in the medium to long term? Good question. And if you do, then you have to imagine millions of people that have barely enough to live on to suddenly being able to save one cent, 10 cents a day. And when they do that, they're typically saving gold because they don't have bank accounts. So you imagine if you, if you believe in the, in the sustained long-term success of these two countries, then that's one data point, right? That will serve to inform you. The second thing, which the kind of the, the, the question, um, uh, the, the, the point I raised earlier is that, do you believe that the world is in a better place now or a shittier place now? <laughs> and if it's better then you know, Maybe gold doesn't have a role to play. If it's shittier, yeah. then gold does. Uh, 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 and then Do you believe it's, sh it's a shittier world now? Oh, for sure. Yes, right. Everything, all, all the indicators are awful, right? Not just the political ones, but look at Gini coefficients. You look at the... The, 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 the wealth, the, the, rich, the yeah, rich and poor yeah, divide. Exactly. So, so, you know, all these things are pointing to huge, huge amounts of stress across cultures, geographies, etc. Uh, without exception. And I think, you know, that points to a, a, a challenges that politicians and policymakers will have to address. And they typically don't address issues um, in anticipation of them. So, for example, if you look at the IMF, uh, they very rarely ever talk about, oh, we think there's going to be a recession next year. <laughs> but they have, and they've been saying it. No, but they generally talk about, you know, they're usually behind the curve, right? So yeah. they always say everything's good, everything's good until like just before. But some of the statements they've been making recently have yes. been uh, sounding quite ominous. So when you do that, you then, when that starts to happen, you, you better take stock and, and take, uh, take that warning seriously because what? they very rarely do that. What about Robin Lee? What does Robin Lee invest in? How, what's guided your investment philosophies in the last I don't know, 20, 30 years since you started working? Um, well, I, you know, I because I was always time poor, I just kind of outsourced it. Right? I just yeah. gave it to my advisors to yeah. invest. Um, I, I like real stuff, so real estate, you know, gold. Um, you got physical? Yes, I have 
physical yeah. not that much now but yeah. because all my money's <laughs> in my startup uh but it's uh you know i i i prefer the real stuff because i i'm a simple guy yeah i have simple needs and, and it's very challenging to make financial decisions without doing a huge amount of homework unless you outsource it um, so for example you know um if i want to choose a unit trust or an etf uh, i you know i a i gotta decide do i do uh country you know do i do no do i do small cap or large cap do i do malaysia do i do asean do i do asia global or do i do industry right yeah energy so many questions or, and then once i do that which fund manager yeah and you know i've been financial services for quite a while that's a huge challenge for me so i can't Cause, imagine because you know too much <laughs> no 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 it's just well, for me to be able to make an informed decision i still can't make an informed decision yeah. without actually doing a lot of work so so you know given that i'm time poor i just put if I'm making investment decisions myself, I just make it on, on really simple stuff. Because yeah. when I invest in, in, and I have invested in shares on the back of, 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 of friends, you know, telling me, giving me tips. That's not investing, that's just pure gambling. Yeah. Because you, know, you haven't done your own research, you haven't done your own due diligence. You're just like betting off someone's whatever. Yeah. So you know, when I invest, I invest in stuff that I understand and, and I'm comfortable with. And those are the few things like real estate, gold, etc. If I don't, I outsource it to professionals and let them make the decisions because I don't have the time bandwidth to make an informed decision. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but now it's just Hello Gold. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you're all in on Hello Gold. I'm all in Hello Gold, yes. Uh, did you ever have, um, when you're young, younger, uh, did you ever have a, a target that you wanted to retire with or you wanted to have a, a certain amount of money because because some people they do right mm. they want to retire with yeah, five million sure. us or 10 million us yeah, or yeah. One of, you know did you ever have that oh yeah i've had that since i was you know i don't know 15. It kept on changing really yeah i wanted to be an so, um, so it's everything right astronaut i want to be an astronaut then i want to be a lawyer then i want to be a banker then i want you know i want to be a footballer but i was shit at football <laughs> uh, then i want to man manage Manchester united but that didn't happen either so so my targets kept on changing um both on the financial and on financial sense I, I think it's great to have targets right but just don't get too obsessed yeah by them because things happen all the time yeah yeah but yes absolutely i had targets um but i i made detours along the way uh yeah. in my life uh in the career choices i made uh which made made those targets less achievable rather than more achievable yeah you know, there's this guy called Yusuf Hashem. He's kind of like this corporate guy that left his job early on in his life. Mm -hmm. he, he left it when he was in his early 50s. And then he spent the, the, the last 20 years, or in fact, the, la the, the last 20 years of his life traveling, seeing the world, Patagonia, mm -hmm. North Pole, yeah. South Pole, that kind of thing. And he's got this idea that um, everybody's life, mm -hmm. uh, of course it's true, right? Mm -hmm. You're on a minimizing time scale. Mm -hmm. If you're 50, then you've got only like 33% of battery life left. Yes. Does that play to your mind when you do this business and at, at some point in time you got to say, okay, look, enough is enough. I'm going to spend the rest of my life, you know, trying to get healthy or whatever or, or seeing the world or whatever, traveling or whatever. Um, yeah, it does, right. Uh, I, I think when you are the 20-something-year-old me uh, didn't think, never thought about life. I mean, when 20-something-year-old me thought 30-year-old was over the hill, right? Yeah, yeah, enough, really, yeah. <laughs> um, the 20 something year old me was very different in terms of my outlook in life and what I wanted to do than the 51 year old me now. So yes, that, that plays to me. I'm very conscious of the, 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 the career sacrifice I've made, you know, cause I, I, I left my last gig, um, and there's a huge opportunity cost, right? Um, because you have that diminishing window. Uh, and, and so y yes, it does. And this is why it comes back to the original point I made is that, look, you don't do this thing if you don't have an itch. And that itch better be so itchy that you, you have no choice but to scratch it. If you can put ointment on it, put ointment on it. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, look, a cousin of mine asked me this uh, just recently, I think just after the New Year, I think he, he was looking at all these opportunities. You know, he had startups, not startups, but, you know, relatively mature startups come to him and ask him, should I... Can I, do you want to work for us? And he said, what do you think? Should I do it for the money? I said, you never do it for the money. Yeah. You do it because you believe in what they're doing. Because, uh, and he's in a great gig, right? So I said to him, you know, you, you do it if you have an itch. Don't, yeah. If there's no itch, don't even think about it. Yeah. Yeah. 
So it's come at a huge sacrifice, right? Because obviously, the, you know, you, you, I'm, sh- I'm sure you don't get to work out enough and to look after your. Well, that's the thing. Right? So this year, so I, I, I actually, so so you're right. So um, for the last year and a half, you know, I have like not really, you know, managed my non-work side. Yeah. And so you, it's like overwhelming yeah. in favor in in in, in the aspect of work and, yes. and whatever and all the other departments are like mm-hmm. without they don't have you yeah. so what I did <laughs> what I did for <laughs> New Year because you know everyone always has New Year's resolutions yeah. so I thought you know what I'm not going to do New Year's resolutions because New Year's resolutions always never work out because I've been doing it for the last I don't know, 30 years so I said I'm going to do it differently this time I'm going to start my New Year's resolutions before New Year's <laughs> <laughs> so I started on Boxing Day and I, and I started working out. I said, I'm going to work out every day as much as I You look like you're quite trim now, you know? So I, I did. Yeah. I've, been, I've been doing that. Uh, and so I'm now in the routine. So that's why. I, so my top tip for 2019 is don't do New Year's resolutions on New Year's Day. Do it before New Year's <laughs> resolutions. So you have a running start. So by the time you get to New Year's Day, you're in the zone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a lot of entrepreneurs, <laughs> they don't know, they don't realize the scale of the sacrifice. It's, it's not just your time away from your family. It's also mm-hmm. time away from your health, your fitness, yeah. your, your body, your spiritual side as well. Because yeah. a lot of people don't have time to meditate or whatever. Yeah, it's, for sure. It's, it's, it's a huge sacrifice. Yeah, but you know, like I said, this is where uh, you, is you have a portfolio of things. Right? You have a portfolio of things that you want to do with your life in yeah. terms of you know, spirituality, getting fit, you know, spending time with your family. And this is why it comes back to my itch. I know I keep on... Uh, labor, you know, talking about it, but that's you don't see it as a sacrifice yeah. when you're in it because this is what you want to do. I mean, you yeah. desperately yeah. want to do it. You know, it's not a job. It's kind of if this is not if if I'm not doing this, I don't feel fulfilled. Yeah, kind of thing. I feel empty. So you don't. I mean, if you start seeing it as a sacrifice, then I think you're in a very dangerous place. Then yeah. you probably shouldn't start it in the first place. Yeah. So, so let's end with success. What, what is success to you? Success to me would be, you know, Hologol being recognized around uh, the emerging markets as the business that brought uh, a great financial solution to a lot of people that are disenfranchised. And so yeah. that we can, you know, and, and in our own way, uh, narrow the gap between the disenfranchised uh, and, and, and the wealthy. Hey man, thanks for doing this. No worries. I'm sure your app and your business will eventually. I'm 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 a client. I'm a convert, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Thank <laughs> I, you. I have been the one that bought gold from Bokong, and I I realized how bloody much I paid for it <laughs> eventually, and then I met you. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. No worries. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.